Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Today I want to continue my introduction of p-adic numbers by reinterpreting p-adic numbers using power series. And the idea behind this is that with this reinterpretation, we can apply the calculus of power series to understand these new gadgets. And the way I'll do this is by broadening our approach slightly and looking at this more general setup that we have here. And in this more general setup, the name that goes with it is the, the concept of completions. And this is something that you find in ring theory. So we're going to start with an arbitrary ring R, and this doesn't necessarily have to be commutative, it can be a non-commutative ring. Uh, we consider an ideal that's given by this Gothic M here. And when we consider completions, often we'll consider the case where it's maximal, but I guess in the construction it doesn't require this. Okay, so given this piece of data here, we can talk about the completion of R at M. And what's that? That's going to be the following ring that's defined the same way I defined the p adic numbers. And that's as follows. What we'll do is we'll look at successive quotients of R modulo powers of the ideal M. R mod M cross R mod M squared cross R mod M cubed and so forth. And we just pick tuples inside there. And they're not arbitrary tuples. What happens is the tuples are such that any term inside there, the i plus first term, that will be some residue class modulo m to the i plus 1. When you reduce it modulo m to the i, must be the same as the previous term, ri. So here you have an infinite product of rings. So this is a ring itself. And this is going to be a subset. And this condition actually is such that it's closed under addition and all the things which makes this actually a subring of this ring here. So here we have the definition of a ring. And it's called the completion of R at M. Now the case uh, that we looked at before was the case where the ring R equals the integers and the maximal ideal P, well P is a prime number being an irreducible inside Z, that gives you a maximal ideal. And we basically had exactly the same thing in this setup here. Now this is an example of a much more general type of construction called the inverse limit. So if you've seen that before, you might recognize that this is the inverse limit and the notation for this is this inverse limit symbol. And you're taking the inverse limit of all these quotients R modulo m to the i for i running over all the positive integers. Okay, so don't worry if you haven't seen this before, but it is suggestive what's going on here and there's some important points to make about this. So the first point is that if you know what R i plus 1 is, well, when you reduce it modulo m to the i, that gives you r i. So if you know the ith term here, that gives you the previous one. And since you know the ith term, you know the i minus 1th term, and so forth down. So to a certain extent, the, the first few terms is already determined by the ones after it. So that's why you have this inverse limit sort of uh, notation here, because the beginning is already determined. You don't need to know that. You can forget about the the first bit, the tail tells you what's going on. Something else that means is that this system is overdetermined. There's too much data that's involved um, when you represent things this way, okay? You don't need to give the first few terms because once you have the last terms, you already know the first few terms. So sometimes you want to have a simpler way of understanding such infinite tuples like this. And what's the way of doing that? Well, that's where the power series come into it. And the easiest example to see that is when we look at the following one over here. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll consider F, double barrel F is our field. And the ring that we're interested in is just a polynomial ring in one variable X. We'll put, pick for our maximal ideal, the principal ideal generated by that X. And we'll consider the completion of this polynomial ring at this maximal ideal. 
So how do we do that? Okay, so we, the elements involved are just these tuples. So we just have to look at a tuple of elements inside here, which satisfies this condition. Okay, so the thing we need is basically a sequence of residue classes, modular higher and higher powers of m. So let's suppose there are one, r two, r three, and so forth. And their residue classes modular high and higher powers of m. So the first one is modular m, so that's the ideal generated by x. The second one is modular m squared, which is the same as the ideal generated by x squared, and so forth. And the condition that we impose is this one here. Ri plus 1 is congruent to Ri modulo m to the i. Okay, so what does that mean? So for example, for i equals 1, when you look at Ri plus 1, that's R2. You consider this element modulo uh, m, and then when you do that, this one has to hit that one. And similarly, this one, when you consider it modulo x squared, that gives you something that maps it into R mod m squared, it has to hit this element here, and so forth. Okay. Now, as I said, this one determines these two, so you can forget about that. So when we build up this sequence, what we want to do is ask ourselves, what's the minimal extra information we need to add to construct the next term? Okay. So let's look here. Okay. So you're looking at the polynomial rings modulo x. Okay. So what types of residue classes can you get? You can only get a constant plus this ideal. Okay. It doesn't matter what polynomial you have here. Okay, when you look at it modulo x, you can forget about the higher order terms and just consider the constant. So it has the form a0 plus x. Okay, now what do you want to do? You want to find some element, some polynomial p2, That's a, and look at the residue class modulo x squared, but it's such that when you reduce it modulo x, you get a0 plus x. Now this one here you can write as a linear term uh, plus x squared and when you go modular x that just keeps the constant term so that means the constant term in this linear term has to be a0 and the coefficient of x can be arbitrary. Okay, So the additional information that you have here is just the coefficient of x. I hope you can see the pattern as to what's going on. So what about this next term here? Of course, you need a quadratic polynomial here, plus x cubed, and it has to have the same linear term. So there's the original linear term here, and we just have to add in the coefficient of x squared. Okay, and these are all, um, so this has a plus x squared. And um, these are all residue classes, plus x cubed. Okay, so I hope you can see the pattern as to what's going on here. So when you continue this pattern, you'll see that r is represented by a formal power series. So when you go in the inverse limit, so to speak, you'll get something of the form a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed plus dot dot dot. Okay, so what does formal mean in this case? Formal means that we don't care about whether this converges or not. I just have a field here anyway. I mean, it could be the reals where you can talk about convergence, but as far as I'm concerned, you can pick any coefficients that you like uh, for the coefficients of x, as long as they're in the field f. So this is a formal power series, and it's clear that uh, uh, if you continue this process, you get this. So given any element of this completion, you get this. But conversely, actually, given any formal power series like this, you can get an infinite tuple which satisfies this condition here, and hence an element of the completion. And it's quite easy to see what it is. Essentially, to get, uh, for example, the uh, the third term here, so you're looking modular x cubed, you essentially look at the 
Taylor approximation to this power series of the appropriate order. In this case, you just look at the first few terms of that order. So there's a complete bijection between the elements of this completion and formal power series like this. And in fact, the relationship between the two runs deeper. These are formal power series, but nevertheless, you can add them together in the usual uh, way by just adding corresponding coefficients. And you can also multiply them together using the Cauchy product formula. And with that addition and multiplication, this set of formal power series becomes a ring. And it's denoted like this. It's very similar notation with the uh, notation for uh, the polynomial ring, except for you use the double brackets around the x here. So this is the ring of formal power series. And it turns out that this completion of this uh, particular polynomial ring at the ideal generated by x is in fact isomorphic to the ring of formal power series. So for our next example, uh, we want to look at the, P, the ring of p-adic integers. We want to try to view the elements in there in the same way in analogy with the power series. And if you use the same sort of argument, you'll find that elements in here do indeed look like power series, but now instead of powers of x, since before we looked at the principal ideal generated by x, here we're looking at the principal ideal generated by p, they're power series in p. So in other words, the things of the form a0 plus a1 p plus a2 p squared plus, and so forth. So it's an infinite series. And now where do the coefficients come from? So this is the bit where it becomes a little bit more complicated. So the coefficients now, ai, they're integers, but they have to satisfy the following inequality. So 0 is less than or equal to ai is less than p. OK, so why is that? OK, so for example, so how does this work? OK, so remember, this should correspond to an infinite tuple. OK, and what are all the elements in the infinite tuple? You should have a number modulo p, a number modulo p squared, a number modulo p cubed, and so forth. So if you have a number modulo p, right, that should correspond to the first term. So that's a0. And to give a number modulo p a0, uh, you should restrict to be in between 0 and p minus 1. Okay? And then if you look modulo p squared, of course, you can write that number uh, in base p. And of course, you can restrict it to be restricted to in between 0 and p squared minus 1. So you can write it in form a0 plus a1p. And of course, you've got the same sort of restriction on these coefficients. And you can keep going. Okay, So the same idea gives this new representation for uh, the elements inside z hat p. So the other thing that I spoke about in my previous video is that this is a domain. And you can talk about its field of fractions. And the field of fractions was the ring of p-adic rational numbers, q hat p. And in this case, the fractions that occur, you can assume that you just divide by powers of p. So if you divide this by a power of p, you get something looking very similar, but you might have now negative powers of p as well. So now you can get Laurent series in p. So the typical element inside here will look like the following form, a maybe uh, starts at minus m, p to the minus m, plus a to the minus m plus 1, p to the minus m plus 1, plus and so forth. And again, you have the same restriction on these uh, coefficients a, i, as you have here. So that's very nice that you can write all the elements inside here very succinctly in this form. And the key point is that all the manipulations that you know about power series from calculus, you can try to repeat in this setting here, but there are some new complications. So I want to show you how that works, and uh, you'll see that there are lots of good ideas that you can learn from calculus that you can transport into this rather interesting setting here. Okay, so let's see the first one. Okay, so remember all these integers are non-negative, so the first thing is that you have a ring here, so what's minus 1? <laughs> okay, so minus 1 you should be able to write as a power series like that. Okay, 
So in this case, it's actually easier to go to the original definition of the uh, ring of p-adic integers. So what do you do? You look at minus 1 and you look modulo p, that's the first term, so that will give you the a0, and you say, well, what's minus 1 congruent to modulo p? What is congruent to p minus 1? So that's the constant term. Okay. Now, what's minus 1 congruent to modulo p squared? Well, it's p squared minus 1, and you write that in uh, base p, so it turns out it's p minus 1 plus p minus, minus 1 times p. Okay. And if you keep going, I hope you can see the pattern. It turns out that all the coefficients of these powers of p are just p minus 1. Okay, so it's rather curious that this infinite power series here corresponds to minus 1, especially since all the uh, factors of the terms are non-negative integers, and in fact are positive integers. Okay, so uh, let's have a little think about this. And this is the thing that's uh, a bit weird the first time you look at this. So normally when you talk about power series, uh, when you look at the power series in x, you think of x as being small. Okay, you look in a neighborhood of say x equals zero, so x is small, and so the terms get smaller and smaller, and that's why you can do this infinite sum. Okay, so here the way to think about this is that you think of p as being small, and in fact there's actually a way you can put a topology on this where p in some sense is a small norm. So you can actually make sense of this in, a, in a, this sum uh, convergence in some funny metric. Okay, so you're going to think of these p's as being small, and that's why you can add higher and higher powers of p, and it does actually converge to something. So if this is minus 1, that means that if you add 1 to this, you should get 0. Okay, so how does that work? Well, let's add 1 to this and see what happens. If you add 1 to this, you get p here. Well, that's a, that's a p, so that's 1 times p, so you can add it to this one p minus 1 times p, so you add uh, how many p's do you have? You have 1 plus p minus 1, so that's p times p. So that's a p squared. Okay, so these terms now get shifted down, so you add a p squared to here, so of course that's a p cubed, and so forth. And you keep getting higher and higher powers of p, which you consider as being smaller and smaller, so that converges to 0. So in this sense, this is a minus 1, and that's your power series representation. So this is a little bit unusual, but that's something that you can do in a power series in P in this uh, ring of P adic integers. Okay, let's look at another interesting example. Okay, so we're going to look at here an infinite geometric progression. It's going to start with 1, and the common ratio is 5. And we're going to work in Z hat 5. So that means that phi 5 we're going to think of as being small, so that if you take higher and higher powers of it, it goes towards zero rapidly. Okay, well it turns out that to this, of course, represents an element inside here. And what element does it represent? Well, it turns out that the usual formula for the sum of a GP works in this case, so it is just 1 on 1 minus 5, which is just negative a quarter. So what does that mean? If you multiply this power series by minus 4, so minus 4 is an element in here, you would, will indeed get 1. Okay, so this is an example where some of the formulae in calculus can be used to help suggest uh, interesting results uh, about p-adic integers. And this one is certainly true. And it's a fun exercise to actually try and prove this. Okay, so I want to just uh, do one last example to show you s some of the interesting phenomena that occurs with calculating with power series inside these p-adic integers. Of course, you should think, well, if you've got minus a quarter, you've got a quarter. And how do you get that? Well, you've got minus one here, and you've got minus a quarter here. So surely a quarter must be just the product of these two. And the key thing is that um, that's true. So firstly, a quarter is, well, in this case, p equals 5. So you have the power series where all the coefficients are 5 minus 1, which is 4. So you multiply that power series, uh, 4 minus 1, 
times this power series for negative a quarter. And the key point is that you can still multiply power series using the usual Cauchy product, but there's a little bit of a twist. So let's just multiply it as usual first, okay? So firstly, you can do the constant term easily enough. So it's four times one, that's the constant term. And then let's look at the coefficient of five. Okay, so how do you get the coefficient of five? Well, you can look at uh, this four times five times this one, or you can look at this one times five, so to speak, times this four. So you have four of them from this product and four of them for this product gives you eight of them. Okay, let's keep going to do the five squared term. How many of them do we have? Well, using the Cauchy product formula, you have this one times these four of those five squared, so there's four there. Then you have this one of these five times this four of this five, so that's one times four is again four. Or you can have one of these five squared times this four times one, so there's four from here, four from here, or four from here. Three lots of four, so I hope you can see the pattern. Okay, 12 times five squared plus dot dot dot. Okay, so the pattern's easy enough to see here. You get 4 as the first coefficient, then 8, 12. They're just multiples of 4 as you go up. So the new thing that happens here that doesn't occur when you do the calculus of formal power series um, in some indeterminate is, of course, this 8 here is not legal, so to speak. Okay, this is greater than the prime, uh, 5, in fact. So you have to reduce it. So if you want to write this out in this form here, this 4 is okay, but you have to write this 8 times 5 as 3 times 5 plus 5 squared. Okay, so that means that you have plus 3 times 5. And now you have 5 squared, 1 5 squared, so you add it to this one, you get 13 5 squareds. Okay, so this 13 modulo 5 gives you 3 plus 3 times 5 squared and there will be um, some extra five cubes, which will affect the next term. So it's a little bit complicated, but the key point is that this multiplication still works because there is a simple algorithm which allows you to determine what the ith term is for any i. So that's how power series work in this um, ring here. And it really allows us to import many of our ideas about the calculus of power series to manipulating p-adic integers. And many of the facts that I mentioned about the ring of p-adic integers is quite easy to see from this type of calculus. For example, if you multiply two non-zero power series of this form together, it's quite easy to see that um, it's going to be non-zero. So this is a domain. Okay? And other facts that are easy to see is, for example, if you have a, a non-zero constant term, then actually it's quite easy to invert using this type of formula here. And so that gives you a lot of invertible elements inside here, and that was also useful to showing that the only maximal ideal inside this ring here is the principal ideal generated by P. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.